Usually when I give a talk like this, uh, I'm sitting in the back trying to put my notes finally together, and I hear somebody walk in, and uh, happened just last month, two young men, one, one points at me, he says, that's him. The other guy says, I didn't read the book of the spy, you know? <laughs> and I never know whether to be crestfallen or elated that I don't look like a spy. Okay? And it's necessary to, to kind of use this as an example of, of the profound misconceptions about what the CIA is all about. Because it's really two CIAs. These are accidents of history. Please raise your hand if I'm not speaking loud enough. Um, Harry Truman had in mind an agency that would be a central one, which would collect all information from whatever source and be responsible. And I guess we're far away from Washington where I can say the word accountable. <laughs> no, no, I kid you not. We were to be accountable, and we were accountable for putting all this information together in a package that the president could read quickly and understand what was going on in the world without fear or favor. If the Pentagon was saying the Russians were 10 feet tall, the president would come and ask our director, how tall are they really? And we usually said about oh, five foot nine and, and, and shrinking, you know. Uh, if you want to know about the effect of the State Department policy, he didn't go to the State Department. The president went to us because we were his staff to tell him what was going on, okay? Now, I worked in that atmosphere. 27 years. It started to get a little bit corrupted toward the end. But the first day I walked into the CIA, uh, it was a new marble foyer in a new marble building that uh, John Kennedy was president, and the, the marble foyer had chiseled into it a scriptural verse which said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I said to myself, No, I didn't say it myself. I heard my Irish grandmother saying to me, Raymond, I'm oh, serious, they always call you Raymond. Raymond, be truthful and honest, and then you won't give it down what anyone says about you. Okay? And I looked at that thing and I said, you know, Grandma, <laughs> this would be a good place to work if that's true. No pun intended, if that's true. And in my part, the analysis part of the agency, that was true. It stopped being true about 15 years ago. But my delight, folks, is to tell you right now that it is once again true on the analysis side. Why do I say that? Anybody know what I'm particularly proud of the CIA analysts have faced into and pronounced on? I'll give you a hint. Iran? At the end of 2007, my former colleagues issued an estimate, the National Intelligence Estimate on Weapons of Mass Destruction in Iran. How close were they to a nuclear weapon? We had been saying for 15 years that they're about, every other year would say, they're about maybe three to five years away from a nuclear weapon. And the three years later, it was a little, about three or five years away. And it got a little embarrassing, you know? So we did a bottom-up assessment throughout 2007. And the conclusion was, Listen to this. Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003 and has not resumed work on a nuclear weapon. <laughs> that put the kibosh on Bush's and Cheney's plans with, with Israel to attack Iran. I mean, Cheney admits it. And Bush, in that wonderful book, book that actually he wrote some portions of that. And, <laughs> when he talks about when he talks about this estimate coming out of the blue, uh, if he were, wasn't briefed on it, uh, you know somebody was grossly negligent. But he said, "I didn't know why they said these things. Why would they? Why would they say Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003?" Well, hello. Uh, I mean, like, could it could it be the truth? You know. He hurried off to Israel, apologized for the estimate, said he didn't agree with this unanimous, with high confidence estimate by 16 U.S. intelligence agencies, and bemoaned the fact that the intelligence agency had pulled the rug out from under the juggernaut 
that was off for war against Iran at the time. Now, how did those conclusions get publicized? Well, they were such, at such variance with what Bush and Cheney had been saying the previous several months. You may recall at one point Bush says, we're, we're doing a, a World War III. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, they're just about to. You know? Well, they weren't just about to. And the, the military knew that. And so did the intelligence community. And some people in Congress. Now, uh, my guess is, and this is an informed guess, that Admiral Mike Mullen, uh, who has some moral conscience to him, also knows what war is like, since he's one of the few people that were still around that had fought in Vietnam. My guess is he went to the president and said, uh, Mr. President, this is a very explosive estimate. And you know, I, I think you need to you need to release the main conclusions of this in a sanitized form because it's going to leak for sure. <laughs> if it doesn't, well, I will, you know. So the president let it out, and that stopped the war. Now, ever since then, I'm talking about the end of 2007. My arithmetic is not very good, but what have we got? Eight, nine, ten, or five years. Uh, every, every year, my former colleagues have been under extreme pressure to say, no, no, we were wrong, or no, there's no, no evidence that they have uh, that they have working on a nuclear weapon. Well, there hasn't been no evidence, and I'm happy to say that James Clapper, the head of the, uh, of the National Intelligence is set up now, under which CIA functions, uh, has, been, has shown a lot of guts on this one, most recently just last month. So, the truth will keep us free and maybe and keep us out of war if the president st uh, stands up to Netanyahu. And that's a big if, my friends. Um, so, just a, a word in passing about the other CIA. <laughs> uh, the other CIA is an accident of history. It's not what Truman intended. And he said so before he died, years before he died. He said, what's, what, what's with this CIA that goes around overthrowing governments and quoting that? That's not what I intended, and it wasn't. Okay. But these things have a dynamic of their own. It came out of the old OSS people in World War II, who were very imaginative, very ambitious, and, and very successful. When they came back, they said, you still need us? And of course, the Russians had overrun Eastern Europe. This KGB, this Soviet secret police was all around the world, so the question answered itself, of course we need you. Now don't go back to academia, don't go back to your law firms or, or your corporations, now stay here. And then some idiot, and I used to get the word, word advisedly, some idiot said, well, let's put these operators over with these analysts because they're doing secret stuff too, you know? So what you end up with is a guy like Bill Casey heading up the CIA, running a secret, semi-secret war in Nicaragua, and the analysis people, they go to the Hill, and the Hill says, well, what do you think about this war in Nicaragua? The analyst says, it's a fool's errand. Killed a lot of people for nothing. But he's gonna say that when his boss is running the war? Give me a break. So you can see the, what I call a, 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 a structural fault here, and it persists. And there's one sentence in the National Security Act of 1947, which sort of authorizes the kinds of things that the operational people have been doing. All it says is, the Director of Central Intelligence shall perform such other tasks and duties as the President shall from time to time direct. That's it, folks. The whole rest of the, that part of the act has to do with the analysis function. Now, what does that give the President? Well, depending on the President, of course, uh, depending on his moral character and his approach to life, that gives a given president his own personal Gestapo and do not blanch before that word. The only check on that is supposed to be the, the congressional what? oversight committees. Well, they, they've long since stopped being oversight committees. Now they're over, overlook committees, okay? And that's why George Bush was able to ask George Tenet and his deputy, John McLaughlin, you got some guys who can torture people? You got some guys who can kidnap them? 
prepare black holes to put them in without telling their wives or their children, much less the Red Cross. And they said, well, we don't have any guys on board, but we'll, you know, we can contract this. We'll, 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 we'll figure it out and we'll do it. And they did it. It was a very sad chapter in our history. They even corrupted the analysts, as you know from that analyst, that, that NIE, the National Intelligence Estimate, which said that Saddam Hussein had all manner of weapons of mass destruction. Well, the analysis part is healed, folks, and I'm just delighted to tell you about that. Uh, the operational thing, well, now we're doing, now we're doing drones and just about everything else that you can imagine. Uh, you know, it's enough to make you a little angry. Um, <laughs> sometimes, well, where I grew up, maybe some of you also grew up in the Bronx or New York or the inner city, you weren't supposed to be angry, you know? And if you, if you got angry, it was sort of frowned upon, you could maybe be angry for a day, if you were Irish, they'd give you a week, maybe. You know. But, you know, it was not, not the thing to do. Well, every now and then, uh, you remember something, at least I remember something I learned in college. I went to Fordham. And uh, we uh, studied a lot of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so much Thomas Aquinas that some of the other students at Catholic universities went around calling us peeping Thomists. <laughs> Anyhow, I remembered that something that Thomas Aquinas had said. And you know, he said a lot of ridiculous things when he didn't know the subject, like things about women, things about when the moon is a certain state or something. But the stuff that he did write about that, uh, on, on things like virtue and, and, and things like that, he was pretty good on, I think, and stands up to scrutiny. Well, question 158 in the Summa Theologica, when you go home, you can check it from your view shelves there. I talked about Thomas Aquinas really, really complaining that there was no word in Latin for the virtue with which he which which he wishes to, to describe. That virtue is the virtue of anger. Got that folks? The virtue of anger. Right. Now he bought that old Pythagorean idea that virtue's in the middle. Alright, so too much, no good, too little, no good. So Take courage. Courage is just enough of what you need. Foolhardiness, too much. Uh, timidity, too little. He complained the word for the virtue of anger, just enough anger, manas inominata, remains unnamed. And to, to deal with that, he went back to the fourth century John Chrysostom, one of the fathers of the church, who said, and this is worth listening to, he or she, who is not angry when there is just cause for anger sins. Why? Because anger, respici bonum justitiae, anger looks to the good of justice. And if you can live amid injustice without anger, you are unjust. Now, as was his custom, uh, Aquinas added a little co colliery of his own to this. He railed against something he called unreasoned patience. That's the best translation we can make. But what do you say? Unreasoned patience sows the seeds of vice, nourishes negligence, and encourages not only bad people, but good people to do evil. Now, unreasoned conscience. Think about Germany in the 30s. Think about all the people who haven't said diddly about our president reversing the Bill of Rights on New Year's Eve, as we all reveled about Tom's in Times Square. I'm speaking about the National Defense Authorization Act, which revokes many of our precious rights, including, not only the Bill of Rights, including habeas corpus, which goes back, my friends, to 1215, when those gutsy English barons faced down King Ching John and said, look, you will not, you will not put us in prison without due process. So, unreasoned patience, I smell, I see a lot of unreasoned patience. And I think what we need to do is, uh, what I try to do, is uh, act in a way so that the truth can come out and the truth can make us free, keep us free. One of the things that, one, I think perhaps the best piece of American literature is uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, 
letter from the Birmingham City Jail. He says hundreds of quotable things in that. But I memorized one little paragraph which goes to this point. I think I memorized it, let's see. He's talking about a boil. Those of you who were adolescents and had the same problem I did with boils, you know how painful they can be and what happens have to get rid of them. Martin Luther King said, like a boil that can never be cured unless it is opened with all its pus-flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, so too injustice must be exposed with all the friction that its exposure creates to the air of human conscience and the light of national opinion before it can be addressed, before it can be solved. We've got a lot of boils on our body politic these days. A lot of boils in our government. And it's up to us folks to open them, let them flow out so that they can be healed. Now, to do this, you need to have some guts, some extraordinary, extraordinary guts. And as I was reviewing the people that uh, have been witnesses for me, uh, you know, I did a little list coming here. And uh, curiously enough, they, they were all women. Now, there, are, <laughs> there are, you know, there are many others, of course, Martin Luther King being one of them, but, um, you know, the prophets that, uh, that, I, that came to my mind uh, from today's world, uh, you know, not the prophets of the 8th century BC, but today's prophets turned out to be mostly women. And I'd like to review a couple of them, but I want to point out that, that prophets usually are considered eccentric. That comes from the Greek words ek and kentron, meaning out of the center. So, yeah, on the, on the margins, uh, people rejected by the mainstream. Now, is that beginning to feel like some of you? Well, be careful now, because you just might be a kook. You know? <laughs> but I see a lot of prophets out there. And I'd like to cite one because they are really eccentric, and very few people know about what Isaiah did. Anybody know that Isaiah went around for two years stark naked? <laughs> that's, that's, the, uh, that's the word. Now, <clears throat> some exegetes without any sense of humor uh, protest and say, well, it's not clear that he was always naked just during liturgical services. <laughs> that may be good exegesis, but it does not get the man off the hook, does it? <laughs> What was he saying, folks? What I think he was saying is, look, I stripped myself of my clothes. And you say, how horrible, how horrible, how terrible. You, you were stripped of the vision with which you were blessed by Yahweh, a vision of justice and shalom, and that is far more reprehensible. I think we need more Isaiahs around, whether the, with or without clothes. But even more, we need the reminder that we can strip ourselves. We can strip ourselves of this vision and be worse, uh, much more condemnable than Isaiah was. Now, let me just quickly go through. I want to leave enough time for questions here, so I'm going to uh, read on the brief side. In thinking about these uh, women prophets, Cindy Sheen comes immediately to mind. You know, she was not going to let the president tell her that her son had died for a noble cause when she knew that that was a lie. And so down in Dallas, with a bunch of veterans for peace, she said, I'm going to go to Crawford and I'm going to ask the president, what noble cause my son Casey died in? And the president for peace said, we're with you, Cindy. We'll go with you. And you know the rest of that chapter, all summer, captive audience, uh, 
porters with nothing else to do in Crawford. Uh, it was one of those uh, serendipitous providential uh, occurrences where she got a lot of press and exposed a lot of the disingenuous. Made, this, made the president so distracted that he didn't even know how to act appropriately when that terrible hurricane hit, uh, hit New Orleans. Uh, he went off and had a birthday cake with John McCain, if memory serves, rather than pretending to what was going on. So he was terribly distracted. So Cindy is one of them. Uh, another is Ann Wright. I think probably Ann has been here. Uh, one of the three Foreign Service officers who quit over the attack on Iraq. And uh, she became mayor, informal mayor of Camp Casey at Crawford, uh, Texas, having the local Texas police eating out of her hand uh, after about a week when, when she showed that she could put everybody uh, everybody in the ditch when they said they had to be in the ditch. Those red fire ants were a real problem until we were able to use some, some other kind of means here. Um, you know, there's one, well, there are the, the code pink ladies of Dallas. They don't seek a lot of uh, a lot of publicity, but George W. Bush can't go out of the house very much without one of those good ladies from the Great Bank in Dallas accompanying him to where he goes. Uh, they want to make sure that people don't forget um, that what we have here is a war criminal, pure and simple, and uh, and they're the ones that have the guts to expose that. Right now, we're preparing for APAC to come into Washington. I think the we'll meeting will begins tomorrow. And you may recall Ray Abile from Code Pink, who had served herself into the Netanyahu speech in Congress and shouted out, uh, free Gaza, uh, free uh, Palestine, and got brutalized by not the police, but the APAC people sitting around her. We know who they are now. And there's a lawsuit going on. I guess maybe uh, I will mention one uh, person uh, who's a male, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. Some of you probably know, I hope, that he has turned state's evidence on what's going on in Afghanistan. He's been traveling around that country for four years, and he knows that what betrays a crystal Who's the fellow there now? Uh, the, the Marine General. They, they're all lying through their teeth, just as they lied during Vietnam. Now I'm old enough to remember that and remember it painfully. They have a very short story. We in the CIA and the rest of the intelligence community in the 60s, late 60s, knew that there were twice as many communist forces under arms as General Westmoreland would admit to. General Westmoreland was the head of the uh, military command in, in, in uh, Saigon. And I was informed because the analyst that was covering this was a good friend of mine, that on the 20th of August, 1967, General Abrams, who was General Westmoreland's deputy, wrote a cable back to Washington. And he said, and said right at the cable, black and white, we can't, we can't possibly accept the numbers that the intelligence community has arrived on. We thought about 500,000 troops, okay? Uh, Westmoreland would not let the, uh, the amount of enemy go above 2,000 at 299,000. I mean, 299,000, doesn't that make you wonder right off? It's sort of like a special 599. And <laughs> but that's what's it, okay? Now, Abrams Cable said this, we can't possibly let the real numbers out because we had been projecting an image of success. And if the press got a hold of this, there would be no way that they would, that, that they could be dissuaded from adopting a gloomy and erroneous Inclusion. A direct quote. Now, I, I just wish that I had the guts in those days that Bradley Manning showed at the age of 22 to take that cable.
straight that cable down to the New York Times bureau there in Washington. No, now, though some of you are shaking your head in the New York Times. No, you have to realize, in those days, 60s, the, the, the New York Times was an independent newspaper, and they would actually publish uh, items like this without checking them out with the White House. Oh, really? No, the, the, you, know, you could get stuff like that in the New York Times. Dan Ellsberg did, okay? So uh, I didn't do that, and I regret that very much to this very day. But Colonel Davis is raising all kinds of uh, interest, I hope, because he's got, he's got the inside view of what's going on in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has just fallen apart, folks. It's a fool's errand, and I wish that John Kerry had the guts to ask himself the same question that he asked about Vietnam. Namely, who, who, what GI is going to be the last soldier to die for, for, for Afghanistan? One of the things that's never mentioned, but as an old infantry officer, I know that it is, it is irresponsible in the extreme to mount any military operation without securing what? Your rear, without having a, uh, a secure means of supply. Uh, you know, the bringing of material in from West Coast to Karachi, up through the length of Pakistan, over the Khyber Pass, down into Afghanistan, where a gallon of gasoline ends up costing $800, folks, okay? Now, forget the cost, it's just not possible to fight a war that way, because you know what? The, Pac the Pakistanis have cut that off. So, you know, it's just a matter of time before all those troops are just back, and we ought to do that sooner rather than later. And, and say about Colonel Davis is he, he said something very strange um, when they asked him on the radio and TV why he thought he had to come out with this, uh, this uh, these conclusions which are such variance with uh, what the government is saying. He said, well, you know, I know what, let's say, do you, why do you believe your lying eyes? <laughs> is I know what my eyes and my contacts have told me. And, get this, I felt a moral responsibility to make sure the American people had a chance to know the truth. Moral responsibility, wow. That's something new in Washington, <laughs> but there are a few still around. Now, let me just, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess what I'd like to talk about now is, is folks that uh, are willing to stick their necks out. Now, it's difficult. Uh, right now, the Occupy movement, there has been a, a, national, a national government at the federal level strategy to dismember, to dissolve the, the Occupy movement. Not only that, but uh, how many, were any of you at the Excel pipeline uh, uh, thing? Yeah, great, all right. It was incredible. What, what, how many, 15,000 people surrounding the, the whole White House complex? And what did the president decide to do? Well, he postponed it. I don't know what he's going to do now, but the... the, the he's the, caving now. Pardon? He's caving now. The White House warmly is going to warmly uh, accept the XL file. Yeah, well, at least it was delayed for a couple weeks or a couple months. <laughs> Anyhow, that show of force, why do I mention that? Because, you know... What cries out for explanation is why Senator Graham, Senator Lieberman, <coughs> Senator Levin, Senator McCain, why they would want to put the draconian language into that National Defense Authorization Act, which allows our military to come in here and pick us all up and bring us out to Guantanamo, put us there forever without any charge or, or judicial process. Now, I hope that you realize that that is possible now. And the question is why they did it. First, we thought it was the crazies, you know, Lieberman, Graham, uh, McCain. Uh, Carl Levin, I thought, had more, more sense. Uh, but it wasn't just they. Uh, Carl Levin explained it was the White House that put the U.S. people in there. The White House wanted to it did to apply to the U.S. people. So, why would they do that? Well, the reason 
I, well, I had to ask myself this because I was interviewed the, the day after they, they signed this. And I'm sitting in the outer room there and I'm thinking, you know, if he has any sense, he's going to ask me why. And we analysts, what do we do? Well, we try to figure out why and what's new, you know? What, what's happened in the last several months that we, ah, they're afraid of us. They're afraid of us, folks. They watched us as we circled around the White House. They watched all the Occupy sites, okay? And they saw that when the police were told to wrap up the demonstration in Albany, what did they do? No, we're part of the 99%, thank you very much. All right? Now, some of the Capitol Police, some of the Park Police, some of the, hopefully, the Secret Service, are beginning to realize they're part of the 99%, okay? So here's Senator Graham, Senator Lieberman, Senator Levin, and they're thinking, wow, we saw what happened on that pipeline thing. Suppose this spring, suppose at the end of March or the end of April, they surround all of us. How are we going to get back to Georgetown for our martinis? How are we going to get out of here? Well, we can call the Capitol Police now. I don't think so. Uh, DC, no, DC police is sure, surely part of the 98%. The Park Police? Park Police has been very nice to these occupiers. Secret Service, not enough of them. We better get the Army. We better carve ourselves out uh, a law that allows us to call the Army in because the Petraeuses and the rest of them, those generals who give the order and those people will do what they're told. We can count on that. That's what I think is going on here, folks. They wanted a reliable instrument what we Soviet analysts used to call organs of state security to protect them uh, against the chance that these other police forces would identify with the rest of us who are trying to get a square deal. <coughs> now, our challenge, of course, is to face up to the 1%. The, uh, well, my Irish grandmother used to call it the, the upper crust, okay? And when I was going out for my first job on the golf course, I was a caddy. Couldn't see real well, so I lost a lot of balls. But I, I was a caddy. That's the only thing you could, could get remuneration from uh, at 14. You had a social security number, you could start caddying. First day I went out there, she said, now Raymond, sit you down. You have to know what you're going in for. Now, she had come from Ireland as an 18-year-old girl, learned sewing and spent the rest of her, until she got married, uh, career uh, making and repairing dresses for a very wealthy lady. So she knew about the upper crust. She said, do you know what the upper crust is, Ray? I said, uh, no, yeah, yeah, I think I do. She said, sit you down. I tell you, the upper crust is a bunch of crumbs held together by a lot of dough. <laughs> And if you remember that, you won't be having trouble in the golf course when they give you a hard time, because they will. And some of them did, some of them were all right. But we need to, we, we need to know that the upper crust, uh, we need to cut through that. It gets stale and crusty, and the fruit underneath gets rotten. And we've got to show that, just like breaking the boil, we've got to break the upper crust and show it's the rotten fruit inside. And to do that, well, to do that, we need to uh, be able to stick our necks out. Now, people have accused me of having something against necks, but I don't. I, you know, necks are very convenient connections between head and torso. I, you know, I, I'd hate to be without one. But if there's nothing for which you will risk your neck, then your neck becomes your idol. And necks are not worthy of idol worship. The time has come, folks, where we're gonna to have to stick our necks out. We're gonna to have to do the kind of civil disobedience that Gandhi did, that others did before us. We have to encourage the more apathetic of our, of our co-citizens to get, in, get into it and to see what's at stake. I look at the politicians and I say, don't these politicians have grandchildren? Don't they care what happens to the world? Don't they care what happens to our rights as citizens? 
are they so so susceptible to, to the allure of money and power that they don't care? Well, we care, and we have to show that we care. Now, are there enough of us? Well, Cesar Chavez used to always say, you know, speeches are nice, and op-eds are nice. They're all, statements are nice, but without action, nothing's ever gonna happen. And that's where I think we are right now. Without action, nothing's going to happen. And people would always say, well, are there enough of us? And he would say, yes. Yes, there are already enough of us. What we have to do is disabuse ourselves of, uh, of the typical, typically American, I think, trait of needing success. Okay? Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, um, you and I, I think, can identify with that. Now, nobody likes to be ridiculed, nobody likes to be laughed at, right? So before you embark on something, uh, something big, you want to make sure there's a reasonable uh, chance that it will be successful, right? Well, uh, that's, that's the frame of mind. We have to get out of that. That's not what the prophets of the 8th century thought, and it certainly isn't what the prophets of, of the last century thought. I, I want to, uh, in closing, talk a little about one of the prophets that uh, actually I did some retreats with right up here in the Poconos. His name is Daniel Berrigan. He's one of my, one of my uh, heroes. He wrote a book, uh, To Dwell in Peace. It's his autobiography. And he addresses this question about needing to have a reasonable prospect of success. Um, what he says is, uh, he talks about Catonsville. For the younger of you, to know that the, the Berrigan brothers and six others, I think, uh, uh, constructed their own napalm and took uh, draft cards out of the uh, federal office there in Catonsville and burned them uh, and, and got arrested. Now, after they used this homemade napalm to, to burn those draft cards in Catonsville, it was May 68, at the height of the Vietnam War. And Dan uses in his uh, his autobiography, why he went ahead and took that risk. Quote, I came upon a precious insight, something like this. Presupposing integrity and discipline, one is justified in entering upon a large risk, not because the outcome is assured, but because the integrity and value of the act speak aloud. Success or efficiency are placed where they belong, in the background. They're not irrelevant, but they are far from central. And Dan says, I needed these reflections because we faced a public that, that they all agreed we were either fools or renegades or plain crazy. He continues, one had very little to go on and one, and one went ahead nonetheless. Still, the little had its own advantage. One was free to concentrate on the act itself, without regard to its reception in the world, free to concentrate on moral preparation, consistency, conscience, looked at in this light, the little appeared a treasure. The act was let go. Its truth and goodness were entrusted to the four winds. Indeed, good consequences were a small matter to me compared with the integrity of the action. The need responded to, the spirits lifted. End quote. Now, Dan Bergen was a, a poet as well as an activist. And he, he, he liked the term activist because as Alice Walker says, uh, activism is her, the rent she pays for living on this planet. And I think we can all be proud that we were really activists. Um, now, Dan Berrigan and the others who were real prophets in my view didn't take themselves very seriously. They had an incredible sense of humor. And this vignette, I think, explains uh, in a way that I could not possibly do it. It shines forth that he's a poet. Quote, we sat in custody in the back room of the Catonsville Post Office, weak with relief, 
those of us who have been arrested and we finally ended this jail cell, you know the feeling. You're weak, but you're relieved, okay? Three or four FBI honchos entered portentously. Their leader, a jut-jawed paradigm, surveyed us from the doorway. His eagle eye lit on Philip, Daniel's brother. He roared out, him again. Good God, I'm changing my religion. <laughs> and then, then his next sentence is, I could think of no greater tribute to my brother Philip. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Occupy is, is starting up again. And those of us who have next that we treasure too much can you know, watch it on TV, I suppose. But those of us who are willing to stick our necks out, you know, um, people, when, when, when I didn't know it was going to happen, but when Hillary Clinton's, uh, when the security types there beat me up pretty bad, um, and then put me in jail, and they dropped the charge. They accused me of uh, like disorderly conduct. You can see the video. Anyhow, I wasn't saying anything. I was just standing there because I didn't want her to get out of that place thinking that everybody agreed with her war mongering. Okay, and uh, people say, "Well, <laughs> look, God, I didn't expect to achieve by that." You know, well, it wasn't that I expected to achieve a lot. It was it was a matter of just being there, being a witness. Uh, and one thing I, I learned about is that uh, when you're over seventy. I see two or three uh, others that are over 70 here. Uh, people don't like to see people over 70 being beat up. It's like beating up little children. Maybe it's worse. I think it's worse. <laughs> so, you know, as I look at, at this, uh, at this uh, group, uh, this, the thought strikes me, and I, you know, I'm saying this genuinely, we have a real advantage here. <laughs> if we want to stick our, head, our necks out, uh, it's going to be more effective than uh, some of the folks sitting over that table here are far too young to incur the kind of sympathy that we engender simply because of our, of our years, okay? I say that only partly in jest, folks. You know, where are the raging grandpas? I said that up in, in New York here. I was speaking with the great region grandma. They're a wonderful group. There were several groups of them. And, uh, and I said this, where are the region grandpas? And I said, if you're interested in studying a region grandpas, come see me afterwards. One person came and gave me his card. You know, we can't be all watching, you know, baseball or football. Or, I mean, it's fine to watch that stuff, but hey, the nation is really in trouble right now. And the most immediate problem is not to let this president get away with thinking that he can kowtow to Benjamin Netanyahu when yeah. he comes to their own yeah. 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 So um, let's uh, let's open it up for questions and answers now. But I want to I want to say this first that uh, this is hard work. It's really hard work and. Uh, um, each one has a role. Not everybody uh, wants to be up front confronting people. That's okay. I mean, everybody has their own little thing to do. What I suggest really strongly is something that comes out of the ethos from the Ecumenical Church of the Savior. And it's something that came new to me. You don't do anything alone, okay? Even Isaiah had a support group. We don't know their names, but he had a support group, okay? So make sure if you're going to deal with this in a, in a considered way, you know, if you're going to think about what you're going to do this spring, other than what you did last spring, then you need to have a small group of supporters, uh, people that you are really simpatico with, people you trust, people you really share with. And that, if you meet with that little group, and I'm talking six people, folks, no more than well, seven is OK. But six, five is okay. Just make sure you have at least one woman in that group because of the women that are the prophets in, the, in this day and age. And I say that very sincerely. And what happens? Well, this little group gets together, they meet every week, once a week, and they do that. 
And before you know it, ideas come out of that little, little meeting that you never would have come at by yourself. Not only ideas, but actions come out. And you know what comes out? Accountability and support, okay? You decide that this would be a good idea to do, everybody in, well, no, four to five, all right, let's do it. Next week, how'd that go? Accountability, okay, and support. Phil Berrigan's place there in, in near Baltimore, uh, with Liz McAllister and the other Catholic workers there, there was a big banner behind the eating place, which says it all. It's like the first duty of true discipleship is to support one another, okay? You can't do it alone, okay? So that's the most important thing. Um, so the other thing is to keep your sense of humor. And I'm going to draw from my Irish heritage right now and, uh, and close with a poem. Uh, it's from Yeats, and it's called The Fiddler of Dooney. Does anybody know it? Good. All right. <laughs> when I play my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My brother is priest in Kilbarnish, my cousin in Bach, Louis. I passed my brother and cousin, and they read from their book of prayer. I read from my book of song that I bought at the Sligo Fair. When we reached the end of time with Peter sitting in state, it called the three old souls up, but it asked me first through the gate. For the good are always the merry, saved by an evil chance. And the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there see me, they'll all rush to me and they'll say, here's the fiddler of Dooney. And they'll dance like a wave of the sea. So I wish you, I wish you honor and courage in the spirit of Dan Berrigan, Phil Berrigan, Gandhi, and the others who resisted and stuck, stuck their necks out. And I wish you justice in, in the form of, uh, of uh, Martin Luther King and all he stood for. And I wish you good humor in the spirit of the Fiddler of Juni. Thank you very much.